Hello, everyone. I'm happy and proud to introduce Dr. Selma Shabanovich, an Associate Professor of Informatics and Cognitive Science at Indiana University, Bloomington. Her research focuses on the social interaction between humans and robots, the societal and cultural factors that may impact them, and the specifics required to develop robots that are effective towards assisting both the individual and various groups. Her presentation today will discuss some of this research, as well as how we can shift our perception of social groups to incorporate socially resilient robots. Please, let's now give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Dabanovich. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for both the invitation and for your um, wonderful introduction. Since we're virtual, I can't see you all, but I'm imagining you're there. Um, it warms my heart. So thank you all, so all for being here for the talk. Um, so as Benjamin mentioned, my research focuses on human robot interaction and social robotics, particularly looking at them in different kinds of social and cultural contexts. So I'm gonna tell you about that a little bit today. Um, and please feel free to ask any kinds of questions um, that you're curious about in relation to my talk directly or anything about robots, social robots. Um, I'm always happy to chat about what you're interested in. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, I have a PhD in something called Science and Technology Studies, um, which is the interdisciplinary study of um, technology and science in society. Uh, and as a doctoral student, I focused on studying social robots in Japan and the US, and I was particularly interested um, in how robotics researchers build sociality into machines. And so um, on the top above, you see the first picture, my first meeting with Paro, um, which as you'll see is a social robot that I've had a chance to work with um, over uh, more than 15 years now. Um, as a doctoral student, I actually went and studied robotics researchers, but one of the things that I found is that as a social scientist, actually many of the questions that I was curious about um, in terms of how people respond to robots, how um, we might think of different kinds of social skills and cues we might build into robots. Those were the same kinds of questions that robotics engineers were also trying to answer. Um, and so through my PhD, I got introduced to the two domains that I'm in now, human robot interaction and social robotics. Um, and I've kind of been participating in them ever since then. Um, these days I have my own lab and you can see some of my students uh, and robots hanging out there um, in the picture on the side. Um, and we all work together um, to explore different aspects of HRI, um, which is human robot interaction and social robotics. So to give you an idea of what I'm gonna talk about today, um, first I'm gonna tell you a little bit of kind of background on this idea of sociality and what it might mean to think about it in relation to robots. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you about two different themes that we have in our work. Um, one is kind of social psychology uh, inspired um, and it has to do with group effects in human robot interaction. Um, and the other one is inspired a little bit more um, kind of maybe sociologically, anthropologically, uh, organizationally and has to do with looking at different kinds of social factors um, that help robots be successful in organizations and communities. And we're also going to talk there uh, a bit more about kind of robot design and what we can um, learn from these types of studies that can inform future robots. So to give you an idea of uh, what inspires many of the questions that we work with in our lab. Um, this is a picture of what Bill Gates called the kind of vision for the future. He wrote this in 2007, um, and this was supposed to be happening quite soon. Um, and so the vision that Bill Gates mentioned was that we are going to have robots in every home. So much like we have PCs in, um, in our home, in our bags, now in our pockets, on our um, arms. Um, the idea here is that robots are kind of going to follow suit, even though right now they're still uh, maybe a little bit exotic, futuristic, don't quite work as well. Um, technological developments will lead us to a point where we can actually see these machines everywhere around us. Here you see some robots on, um, on the lawn, they're in the house, they're folding towels. Um, 
We already have Roombas uh, cleaning our floors. I don't know if any of you do. Um, we have one, we've had one for a long time. Um, and another area that you see robots working in here is actually assisting people. So here you see an older adult in bed with the robot bringing them some refreshments. Um, and this is a very typical kind of um, description of what our future with robots might look like. Um, but one of the things that we like to do in our lab is also kind of take a look back at this picture um, and think about it a little bit critically. Um, so one of the things that I think we see here is there are definitely a lot of robots um, but there are very few people in this home. Um, the only person here is the older adult that's being helped. Um, and you might argue that in the way that uh, they're positioned, they're kind of like a more of an object of the robot's work um, rather than seemingly a very active agent. Um, and so this kind of this kind of picture, I think, exemplifies a little bit of um, something that, you know, we find troublesome um, in the design of robots, which is that sometimes when we focus on uh, autonomy, on the technology behind the robots, we start forgetting about the people and we start forgetting um, about the richness of human experience. We kind of uh, maybe make them seem more functional or um, reduce them to certain uh, characteristics that are parsable to uh, to the robots. And in this way, we often disregard the broader networks of humans who are behind both the design of robots and also who have to be there to make the robots really be able to do their work in a human social context. Um, and this kind of critique has been brought into um, robotics both from uh, kind of anthropology and sociology. Um, and social scientists often bring this consideration, which is that when we think of when we think of humans as social beings, we don't think of them kind of individually and as separate from others. Humans are social because they're constructed as social by others around them, because they're constantly engaged in social interactions with others, um, which reinforce their sociality. And so I think this is something that we can also bring more of into robotics, not sociality as kind of individual, very specific characteristics. So you could imagine this, if you look at the robot on this picture here, um, this robot has a face, it can also talk, um, it actually has clothes and it's in this kind of human receptionist environment. When it talks to you, it can tell you it has interests and in things. So its sociality is kind of defined as maybe these different characteristics that it has. Um, but if we think a little bit more deeply about what it means to be social, we also consider that sociality is something that the person is bringing into this interaction. It's something that's constructed as the robot and the person engage with each other. So this is the kind of perspective on sociality that I want to, that I take in my work and that I want to kind of bring in um, through in this talk. Uh, and we actually see this happening with robots, however they're designed. So I, I like whether they're designed with this notion of sociality in mind or not. Um, so this is an example of a very, very early robot um, in a human social context. Um, this robot, I'm going to show you a little video, but um, this robot is called Grace. She's the graduate robot attending a conference. Um, and the aim of the robot at this conference, this was in 2003, was to go and register itself just as a, as a typical registrant would, and then actually go and give a talk. Um, and so at this point, Grace is trying to register itself. And so you can kind of see what happens. So at this point, normally I would ask you, what do you think happened? Um, but since we're in a slightly different modality, I'm just going to answer for you. I know you, I know you got it, but as you see, Grace was trying to get in line. The robot thought that there was actually the end of the line was this, um, 
this hole between the two people and it kind of drove itself in there. For the people around it, it seemed like it was doing something very human. It was basically cutting the line and this was met with a lot of delight. Um, I've heard afterwards comments that this was the most human thing, um, the most social thing the robot did in the whole conference. Um, and so the reason I, I often show this video is that it's a great um, example of how something that we're, we perceive as sociality is really part of both um, the interaction of things that the robot does and these interpretations um, and predispositions that humans bring into the interaction. Um, and all of these people around the robot are roboticists, so they know how it works, they know what it is, but still they can kind of delight in this momentary, in this moment where Grace does something unexpected, something um, very human-like. And so when we start looking at, um, at robots in everyday life, interacting with a much more diverse set of, um, of people, uh, users of different ages, cultures, um, in different kinds of social contexts. Um, one of the things that we see is that not only do people have these moments of interpretation, but often they engage with robots at, in groups. So not as a one-on-one -on -one interaction, but as an interaction of the robot and multiple people at once. Um, also recently, as uh, different, as more and more uh, various companies have started developing robots for everyday purposes, um, particularly kind of uh, robot, like personal robots or robots for use in the home, um, in schools, in hospitals, in um, nursing institutions, other healthcare institutions. Um, we see that they're actually being designed to act in group interaction um, environments or to interact in spaces where they're assumed to have multiple users, more than one kind of user. Um, we also see robots becoming more prevalent, you know, slowly uh, more prevalent in society. These are some pictures of um, robots at work. Um, so robots selling things, robots working with people in manufacturing, robots um, assisting in nursing environments. Um, and as they become more prevalent in society, um, they also tend to have consequences, not just on the people they interact with directly, but also on people they that are kind of around, um, around them and on the institutions and organizations that they become a part of. Um, and finally, since this is a cognitive science, um, gathering. I also wanted to just throw in a bit of um, cognitive science. Something that we know about human social cognition um, is that it works at different levels um, in diff and it works differently. You can find different types of cognition depending on um, the, the size of the group that you're looking at. Um, so often in human robot interaction, we focus on the dyad, on one on one interaction. Um, but when we look at people, uh, we also see beyond the dyad, um, we see work groups and family groups that are salient. Um, we see slightly larger groups and even bigger, um, bigger kind of groups of, you know, 30 people, 300 people, larger gatherings um, that are important for different functions that, um, that humans have both socially um, and cognitively. And so uh, one of the things that I look at is thinking through um, if maybe we know a lot now about dyadic interaction between humans and robots, but we need to start thinking about these other levels um, of social interaction as well and how robots will fit into them. How will they fit into a work group? How will they fit into an organization um, that, uh, that has more people um, in it? So that's what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. Um, robots in small group um, and organizational and community interaction. So the first part that I wanna talk about is kind of robots in small groups. And this is work um, that I did with several of my students and also Elliot Smith, um, who is a social psychologist. Um, and we've done it over the past five or so years um, with some NSF funding. Um, and what we base this work on is this thing that we saw um, when we studied robots in open-ended environments, which is that people interact with them in groups, um, but also the notion that robots themselves may come in groups. 
Um, so there might be more than one um, there at any particular time, kind of like we saw in the picture um, that I showed initially with Gates's vision of robots in the home. Um, and group interactions, as social psychologists know, are different than individual interactions. Um, when people are in social groups, um, they can be much more aggressive and competitive with people who are outside of their group. They can be much more positive and forgiving to people who are in their group. Um, when we look at human robot interaction, we see different circumstances under which people have been shown to treat robots as an in-group, so part of their group. And that's, this can be when they're cued very, um, in very some, somewhat, you might say, simplistic ways. So by saying like, here you go, you're out, you're, you two are on the red team, you and this robot. Or by saying, you know, this robot is from, this is a Berkeley robot, um, it's part of your team. Um, we also see uh, sometimes in kind of natural interactions that, uh, particularly in Japan, there were these interactions where they saw little kids in a mall gang up on a robot that was there as a kind of assistive um, or a communication technology. So we see it kind of happening, not just when it's cued in experiments, but also in more naturalistic circumstances. Um, and so since robots can be seen both as an in-group and an out-group, one of the things that we consider is that if we think about negative effects of these kind of group understandings and group interactions on robots, we could think that perhaps people um, who are generally unfamiliar with robots um, could see that could stereotype them more, think about them more negatively. Um, perhaps because robots are often very similar in phys can be very similar in physical appearance. Um, you know, you can have 10 of the same robot. Maybe this could be perceived as threatening, um, just like we might perceive, um, you know, a group that's not our group kind of dressed completely the same and behaving completely synchronously. We might see that as a little bit more, um, threatening. Um, and also one of the things we considered is if we see robots as an out group, we could kind of feel more close to other humans um, because this can exaggerate our differences with robots and also our similarities to each other. Um, so we've been, as I mentioned, studying these kind of group effects in HRI over the past five years. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the different kinds of things we looked at um, and we found. So one of our first studies that we did um, had to do with um, with people's reactions to multiple robots. Um, and so here we basically showed people videos. I'm just going to start them all at once because it doesn't matter. But they were videos of robots in groups um, and robots individually. And we had them rate, rate them in an online survey on many different, um, with many different kinds of questionnaires having to do with their feelings, attitudes towards the robots, feelings towards the robots, how they perceive the robots to be in terms of intelligence and friendliness and all these other kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that we found um, is that there was a difference depending on number, but that the difference depending on number also related to the appearance of the robots. So people liked um, multiple humanoid robots more than multiple mechanical robots. Um, and then multiple mechanical robots they liked more when they were single for some reason. Um, so this showed us that this group effect does happen here with robots, but we weren't sure why and what was happening. Um, so we started doing more studies. And of course, this one was done online. So especially with robots where the kind of in-person interaction and the physical embodiment of the robot is such an important cue, um, we, we always like to do studies that are in person as much as we can. Um, so in the second study, one of my, um, my doctoral students did a study in Japan and in the U.S. where she looked at, um, um, her name is Marlene Frowney, where she looked at how we might think about um, people perceiving and interacting with uh, both single and multiple robots um, that have different kinds of uh, interactive behaviors. So in some cases, these robots were more socially interactive, and in some cases, they were more functionally interactive. And this video is going to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea of what that looks like. Um, so 
so the robots we worked with were these social trash boxes. Um, and what they did was hang out in a university cafeteria in the US and in Japan um, and approach people so that they could throw trash in them. As you see, people are throwing trash, thank you. Um, and so the functional robots, like the one you see here, um, moved around, and but they didn't really respond to the people very much. So they didn't kind of give them any particularly social cues. Sometimes they were in a group, um, and that was great. Um, but they had a different kind of behavior than the socially interactive trash boxes, which you'll see here. So this is the single condition, and here they kind of look around and they bow and nod to people. Um, sometimes they follow people around. Um, and so they're more deliberately engaging um, with, with people. And so these were also single and multiple. And they also thank people for throwing in trash. Um, um, one of the things that we found um, is that people definitely interacted more um, with the robot group than with the individual robot which you could also think, well, they were more than they were easier to see and easier to kind of get to. Um, so maybe that's partly it. But we also saw that single social robots were rated more highly than the social robots in groups, while when they were functional, they were rated more highly in groups than individually. So there was, again, kind of a difference based on the context or the type of robot and how the groupness of them or the individuality interacted with that. Um, we saw some differences in the U.S. and Japan um, also, but not, um, not as strong. So the idea I want to leave you with is that the number of robots that people interact with matters, but that this has, is also uh, kind of colored. It's related to not just the number, but also the robot type, their behavior, the social role, the, the task context, et cetera. So you need to kind of consider robot number in a broader context. Um, we've also looked at certain kinds of group characteristics and their effect on human robot interaction. Um, and so we've looked at something called entitativity. So how similar, how groupish are the robots? Um, in one study, uh, we looked at whether people perceived, we found that people actually found, uh, robots that are more similar to be more threatening. Um, than robots that were more diverse and also to have less mind. Um, and also uh, in another competitive collaborate study, we also found that participants perceived entitative robots as more threatening. Um, we've also looked at the uh, effects of the characteristics of human groups on human robot interactions. So this was in a study of open-ended interactions with a robot in a mall. Um, you can see there's groups of people and there's a little robot in there. Um, and it was a basically a, a study of video um, of the naturalistic interactions that happened between people. And then we looked at different aspects of the group. So whether they were family or friends, um, whether they were uh, of different kinds of gender composition, um, and we found that those were actually um, significant. So one of the things we found is people in groups were more likely to interact with robots than individuals. They also interacted for longer. Um, entitative groups liked the robots more. Um, there were some effects of gender composition. Um, and oops, and people were more likely to interact with the robot if they'd seen somebody else interacting. Um, so it's not just the robot group characteristics, but also the human group characteristics that matter. Um, so something that we find is that the group dynamics can be used to improve HRI, but we have to think about robot appearance and behavior um, and consider how human groups might interact differently based on their composition. Um, we also looked at different interventions we might use to actually decrease prejudice in robots if pe people have kind of negative predispositions to begin with. Um, and so one thing we tried was perspective taking, which is putting yourself in the shoes of another, which works with humans, um, did not quite work with our robot. Another thing we tried was contact, which is 
Um, in human groups, if you have contact with a perceived out group later on, um, people tend to have better attitudes towards the out group in general. Um, we also didn't have clear effects there. Um, one thing we did see in one of our touch studies with the robot now, which is this little blue one in the bottom, um, is that people who came into contact with the robot and who initially had somewhat positive perceptions um, had even more positive perceptions afterwards, but people who had negative perceptions initially had even more negative perceptions later. So um, this kind of contact we noticed can also potentially backfire. Um, so you have to know um, what kind of person, what the person's predispositions are before you use that kind of strategy. Um, the most successful strategy we found in terms of getting people to be more positive towards robots was actually to just frame them as in-group members. Um, so this also works with humans. Um, if humans feel that they're together in a group, they'll be more cooperative, they'll morally favor the other person, they'll have more positive perceptions. Um, and we studied this with robots um, in a game scenario where we had people playing on a team with robots um, and other people, and then against, a, against another team that had robots and other people in it. Um, and every time during different turns, they, had the op they were given the opportunity to give noise blasts of different um, loudness to all of the participants. And so what we did was basically measure not just their subjective perceptions, but also they, their behavior towards others through these no noise blasts. Um, and what we found was that participants gave louder sounds to outgroup humans than to the in-group robots. Um, they also rated the in, all the in-group members as having more positive human nature traits. Um, and in the in-group, the robots were treated rather similarly to humans. And we've replicated these results um, in the U.S. and Japan um, so uh, several times. So these, we feel, are pretty strong. Um, We've also found that, I know we're always afraid of negative emotions towards robots, but we also found that made positive emotions were actually stronger predictors of people willingness to interact with robots in the future. So some of the things that we kind of extract from all these studies is that in-group membership and eliciting positive emotion can improve perceptions of robots, but should be used with care. And what I mean with this is that particularly in the in-group um, in the studies where we made robots in-group members but had out-group member humans, we actually found that people treated the in-group robots with more care than out-group humans, which, you know, in our in-lab game did not make a huge difference. But when we start thinking about these being used in, um, in more teamwork scenarios or in, you know, in factories, in um, hospitals or caregiving situations, we could see where you know, this could start being very um, problematic. And so that's what I mean by should be used with care. Um, so when we design for robots, we now suggest we need to really think about it in the context of group interaction. Um, this social psychology framework transfers to HRI, but it has its own kind of special dynamics there. Um, the number of people in robots matters, but those are also mediated by different kinds of factors like robot appearance and behaviors, their um, social roles. Um, we also need to think about um, robots as in-group members being more positively perceived, but then also consider how that reflects on other in-group members that might be human. Um, and so I think this is this is another, this is an area of work that we kind of continue along with looking more um, in more detail about human robot interaction in groups and kind of teamwork um, and other co contexts like that. So to go on with the next uh, theme, so when I was thinking of groups, these were kind of smaller group interactions, let's say, you know, two, three, four, five people. Um, but when we think of human robot interaction in everyday environments, we often envision robots being used in different kind of organizational and community settings. Um, and we have particularly looked at robots in, um, in kind of nursing home and elder care settings, um, as well as uh, in some cases in educational and as here you see in intergenerational settings. So a place where both there's both elder care and child care in one space. Um, 
And so for the rest of the talk, I just want to give you um, some ideas of what kinds of things we see as factors that are important to human robot interaction and design um, and the effects of robots on organizations and communities when we look at them um, in this context. So as I mentioned, PARO in the beginning, PARO, uh, the robot seal, was the first robot that I ever uh, kind of interacted with um, and worked with. And um, I met Paro in Japan where it was being used with older adults in a um, care home, as you see here in the video. And one of the things that struck me about Paro is the way that its design was described by its creator, Dr. Um, Takanori Shibata. Um, and so he describes Paro as having a limited number of functions as a machine, but through interaction with human beings, Paro ends up extending its functions by the kinds of associations and interpretations that humans bring into the um, interaction. Um, and so as you can perhaps tell, um, this relates very well to that initial description of sociality that I was uh, giving you in the beginning, which is that sociality is something that is born in and of the interaction. It's not just a characteristic of the object, the artifact, or the agent in itself. Um, and so because of this kind of match of Paro's design rationale with um, the way that I like to consider sociality, um, one of the things we've looked at over uh, many years is how does Paro, how do people actually interpret um, and what do they do with Paro? How do they adapt it to their environment? Um, since it has this underdefined design, it leaves space for people to bring something in. So one area that we've used PARO in is group therapy. This is often the, um, the typical kind of scenario that PARO's use is um, suggested for. So um, in Japan, many different places, people use PARO in this kind of group environment. Um, and so one of the first studies we did here in the U.S. was observing how uh, therapists use PARO in group multisensory behavioral therapy to see whether it has any effect on the kind of behaviors and social and interactivity of the participants. Um, one thing we found that was interesting was that both direct interactions, so the person who had PARO in their, in their hands was kind of more um, engaged, but also the people around also became more engaged and paid more attention and were less likely to like fall asleep, for example, um, when Paro was around. Um, but the other thing that we noticed in these group therapy sessions was the importance of the therapist's facilitation um, and the kind of the different ways in which they could present Paro to different um, members of the group based on their knowledge of their background, their needs, their interests, and those kinds of things. So this was a, an inkling into um, how the robot itself is not the thing that creates these positive um, effects regarding engagement or psychological effect on the person, but it's really the robot as it's being used by the therapist, as it is situated in this kind of social context. Um, so we also went on to do some studies that were more open-ended in the same nursing home where we put PARO just in a kind of recreational area of the home. Um, as you can see here, it's sitting on this desk where there are kind of puzzles and toys and books around. Um, and normally what people would do in this space is when they had some free time or wanted to socialize with others, they would come and they could, you know, read a book or play a game or chat with somebody. Um, and so we put Paro there for several months and just observed interactions with the robot over time. Um, just to see, you know, how would people interact? Um, what would happen? Um, and one of the things that we were surprised by was that actually people more often than not ignored the robot. Um, so Paro was not kind of all by itself immediately engaging in the way that one might desire or hope um, with a socially interactive robot. Um, but then what we did was study, kind of compare the times that no, people chose to ignore the robot and hence people chose to actually interact with it. And we saw some interesting differences between those, um, those moments. And so um, what we 
kind of extracted out of those was a series of social factors um, that led to people's engagement with PARO and to kind of what we might say successful HRI, HRI uh, human robot interaction, um, rather than ignoring the robot. Um, so one of those factors was had to do with gender. So we saw that women interacted directly with the robot more often than men. Um, we also saw similarly to the group where the therapists kind of mediation was central, that social mediation more generally was really important. So if there was somebody else around who could introduce the older adult to the robot or who could engage with them in the interaction together, people were more likely to interact. Um, we also saw something we call invisible labor. So um, both performed by staff and other older adults to socialize PARO, to kind of present it as this social interactive thing that others should engage with. Um, but also in interactions between um, staff that were not necessarily care staff, so like janitorial staff, who would actually chat with and socialize with and check up on the older adults throughout the day. Um, we saw a kind of mutual shaping happening. So in the, and what I mean by this um, is in the beginning, um, when we introduced the robot, there were a few staff members who were really excited about it, and then others were very skeptical and said, like, this is really unlikely to be useful for anything, and actually we can't think of any use of robots in this particular um, institution. And then after seeing the robot used for several months and the way that some older adults responded to it, um, when we did interviews later on, we found that more of the staff had both more positive perceptions of PARO, but also started having more ideas of what they might do with um, robotic technologies in, um, in their institutional environment to begin with. Um, we also saw the staff kind of coming up with their own, and, and the older adults coming up with their own ad adaptations and interpretations of the robot. Um, so individual older adults, um, kind of used the robot in different ways. Some used it as expected as a pet. Um, some kind of reflected on their own troubles by talking to it, asking it if it's lonely or if it had been left there. Um, my favorite kind of use that I've seen of it was actually as a social mediator. So um, one of the older adults who lived there, we had seen her um, many times, even before the robot uh, was put in there. Um, she would often kind of walk around and try to find somebody to talk to. Um, and when the robot was put in there, we noticed that she never interacted with the robot unless she noticed that somebody was around and she could actually use the robot as a social lure to get that other person to talk to them, to, to talk to her um, about the robot itself. Um, we also saw nurses kind of adapt the robot to their t routines. So they found one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions to be particularly useful. They used it to calm agitated residents. Um, and I, I've also had the opportunity to travel in Japan and see the robot's use in various nursing homes. And we saw similar kinds of appropriation and adaptation to the context. Um, so for example, giving the robot for the to elderly who can't exercise so they could still participate in something during the group activity or putting it at the door of a nursing home um, to kind of stop older adults from wandering out, they would kind of get engaged with the robot rather than not. Um, so this just shows how much kind of labor and interpretation and adaptation the people around the robot actually bring to its use in the institution. Um, we've also looked at other organizational factors in other institutions. Um, we've studied both Joy for All, which is that cat in the back, and PARO um, in several other nursing institutions and found that, again, people adapt them um, to their needs, but also that their final choices of which one to get have to do with available resources. So um, everyone really appreciates and loves PARO, but PARO is a more expensive and the joy for all is much cheaper. So it actually requires more labor to take care of because the nursing staff is afraid to leave it alone with residents. So they end up getting the joy for all, for example, because that requires less labor on their part and is easier to purchase without special um, approvals in the institution. So we've seen several places actually adopt the joy for all during or after our studies. Um, so to leave you with the thought here, I just want to kind of um, you to think about the way that the social context affects robots use 
and also how robots require human effort to be successfully adapted um, and used in organizational contexts. Um, and finally, I know I have about five minutes, so I'm just gonna give you a quick run through of another direction that we're working on now, which is actually developing robots for communities. Um, and in this, we're working with an intergenerational community that has both older adults and kids in a daycare there. Um, and one of the things that we were curious about there is thinking about how we can think about robot design in relation not to individual preferences. So did it make, does somebody like it or did it make an individual happy, but rather community goals. And the goal of this particular community is to have um, children and older adults engage in interaction together. So intergenerational interaction. Um, and so we've done several things here. Um, one of the initial studies we did was actually bring in several different robots, Paro, now, which is a humanoid, Cosmo, which was a little kind of toy robot, a beam, which is a big telepresence robot, and test them out in the, in the intergenerational daycare. And one of the things we found is that the kind of interaction that works very well for inspiring kids and older adults to engage with each other isn't necessarily the same as the interaction that inspires somebody to engage directly with the robot. So we found that Paro, because it's something that you have to hold close to you, and then which brings the kids and older adults closer together, worked very well. It also isn't too engaging in the sense of it's not constantly talking or asking questions or asking to be kind of engaged with directly. So older adults and kids could talk around it more. Um, which made it successful. Um, now the humanoid, when it actually had a hard time hearing and couldn't respond, inspired kids and older adults to chat with each other. So um, it made us think that a different kind of moderately active interaction style rather than the constantly and consistently engaging style that maybe one-on-one -on -one interaction um, was pointing towards is something that works better for this particular community. Um, and here you can just see folks kind of playing with the robots there. Um, this community later on got its own robots. So now we're able to kind of follow how they're using them during drawing activities, just day-to-day -day interaction um, in exercise. Um, and we've also been working with them to um, design robots to support their intergenerational interactions. So here you can see kind of a little Gameplay scenario. And they do singing and some other things. So basically, we're trying to build the robot to interact in the kinds of activities that older adults and kids do there um, normally. Um, and we've seen different benefits. So thinking about different types of goals, more community level goals and dynamics, and also thinking about what are community level metrics. So how do we measure the success of the robot? Not necessarily just in terms of the um, individual people's um, satisfaction with it, but also how it affects the workflow of the community. And so what we're doing now is actually working with the clinicians there to figure out different activities that they find could find useful, where they think robots could kind of fit into what they're trying to do and then kind of design for that. Um, so what I want to leave with you with here is that this kind of focus on not just individual interaction, but on organizational interaction and actually collaboration with the community can lead robot design to incorporate different design aims um, and features that fit community goals and values, not so, not just kind of individual interaction um, goals, but really the community goals. Um, and so the bigger picture um, of our work is really on trying to think about developing HRI in a broader social context. Um, so one thing I think by going beyond dyadic interaction um, to question is the notion of robot autonomy. Um, when we think of robots as autonomous artifacts, it often brings us to this idea that they can do things by themselves. We're just gonna you know, design them, put them in places, they're gonna do things by themselves, and it's gonna be great. 
Um, but actually, when we use robots um, in different places, we find that's not quite the case. Um, you need a lot of human labor um, to make that happen, to make the robot work. So it's not just like we are not autonomous in the sense of we are not alone. We are not an island. Um, we depend on other people around us um, to kind of help us do things. Um, robots are similar. They need uh, both other people, but also particular institutional and socio-technical infrastructures to be successful. And we have to think about what those are um, and what the introduction of robots into different or groups, organizations, and communities actually means for not just the direct interactors, but like all the different people that are around the different kind of workflows um, and aims of institutions and communities and different values that are involved in those. Um, we have to think about what the consequences for that will be. Um, and so I hope that at the end of this, one of the things you can think of is not just, you know, groups and communities and organizations are important for the design of robots and thinking about them and their dynamics is important, but also that robots are part of kind of a bigger socio-technical system. And so when we design them, we really have to think about um, the larger, broader context and system and how we're also really designing it and envisioning it in some way, um, even as we might in the moment focus on this particular technology. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. Um, and I'm happy to answer, not just to you um, for hanging out here and listening to me, um, but also to all my amazing students um, who are um, the, the folks on the ground who do a lot of this stuff, um, to all of our partners and collaborators and also um, our funders. So now I'm happy to answer questions. And I'm just, I guess I can stay here um, and you'll see me. All right, so I will go open the Q&A here. Okay, so the first question we have is, does an individual's exposure to technology plus robots affect their perception of including robots in social groups? For example, teenagers now are far more comfortable with technology than their parents. Yeah, I mean, I think it can, and there's a lot um, made of what people's, uh, exposure to different media, for example, relating to robots is. Um, so as I mentioned early on in my life, I was very interested in this difference between robots in the U.S. and robots in Japan. And often there's the discussion that in Japan, there are a lot more positive interpretations of robots in media, whereas in the U.S., you know, we think of Terminator um, or, I don't know, iRobot, some other scary instantiations of robots, um, that there's a more negative interpretation. Um, and that, to some degree, can color people's perceptions. Um, but I think then it also has to do with, um, with the type of interactions and the kind of context that they end up being in with the robot. So I think if you, um, if you think of it in this broader sense that I was just talking about, if the robot seems to be taking away from a part, part of your job that you really enjoy. So if, you know, part of your job is to, I'm just going to invent something, go into an older adult's room and, you know, pick up the, their breakfast every, or take them their breakfast every morning. Um, that seems like a very menial task, right? You're just taking a tray, you're dropping it off, you're, um, and you could do that with a robot. But, um, but really, one of the other things you do during that period is you might chit chat a little bit, say good morning, how are they that day? You might actually kind of look at them and see if they look okay, how are they feeling? Um, and that might be something that you value as a worker. So I think in that case, whatever kind of prior predisposition you might have had towards robots, if it kind of seems like it's gonna take away from that, something that you value either in your job or in your interactions with others or in your immediate environment, I think over time that actually becomes more salient. Um, but maybe some of this kind of initial predisposition can matter in the, in the very beginning. Uh, next question. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could address the phenomenon of humans bonding with household robots. Many of my friends with Roombas will, tell, will treat it almost like a pet and feel compelled to take care for it. Yes, I think that is, um, that is a great question and it's something that's often seen with robots. Um, we also 
uh, kind of baby our Roomba in some sense. We give it uh, stickers when it does really well so, or does a very hard um, vacuuming job. Um, but I think, you know, this happens, humans tend to anthropomorphize many things and things that exist in your environment for a long period of time, you can make a connection. With. Of course, you know, Roomba is actually not a robot that particularly tries to engage with you at that level. But I think some of the other robots that people, that, you know, we and others are designing actually try to engage much more in that. So robots that might converse with you or Paro that more, has more of a pet-like interaction, um, you know, robots that talk or that try to kind of engage with you in conversations about different day-to-day -day, um, things that matter to you so or give you information and things like that. So I think what you're seeing with Roomba is kind of just one small aspect of that. But in other cases, you could see even more of it um, because the machines are kind of being designed to extract more of that kind of interaction. However, there is also, um, you know, a potential blowback if something which people have seen, maybe you've heard of kind of the notion of the uncanny valley, something that is, you know, almost human-like, but not quite, which makes you feel very uncomfortable. Um, similarly, sometimes when robots, you can see some of this uncanny valley stuff happening, but you can also see sometimes if robots seem to overpromise in terms of their capability to interact with people and be kind of social and then under deliver, um, even in a much more social robot, you could see less, um, less kind of attachment or less engagement of the type you see with the Roomba. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very astute um, thing that you've, you've seen there. Um, and it's definitely a, a topic that many people are interested in is why does it happen? When does it happen? Um, and when does it, why doesn't it happen in some cases where it's actually very much desired in terms of the designers? What are the future goals and implications of pro-social robot research? How do you foresee this behavior and positive perception impacting the spaces in which we're introducing robots and AI? That is a very big and broad question. Um, so I, I guess you could take it from, from different angles. So one of the words that I, um, that kind of stood out to me there was the notion of pro-social. Um, so there is, there is actually now um, additional interest. Initially, I think there was a lot of interest in just making the robots seem socially interactive. Um, I think these days there's actually increasing interest in also having robots be something that potentially, you know, in some cases nudges people towards certain kinds of behaviors, could be pro-social behaviors um, or, you know, more healthful behaviors, more, um, you know, beneficial to them or others types of behaviors. And of course, you know, that sounds um, really compelling. Um, at the same time, there's always the question of how does this kind of relate to issues of, you know, human autonomy, ability to kind of decide for things on your own, um, ability to interpret, to be aware that you're maybe being nudged or being kind of pushed in a certain dire direction behaviorally or in terms of your attitudes and things like that. Um, and so it's definitely something that folks are starting to think about um, and consider in robot design as well. Um, and maybe think about a little bit more critically um, when we start to consider that we might design robots that can affect people's behavior in certain ways. Um, and, and even if those ways are initially kind of defined as, potent, as po something positive, right? Something that's pro-social or, or helpful, for example. Um, and then in terms of consequences, um, I mean, of course, we often think of robots very futuristically, so it seems like we can't prognosticate consequences, but I think we can also look at both technologies that we have today um, and learn from those and think about those in terms of what we might expect to see in robots. So we have, you know, experience with automation in the workplace, um, you know, in some cases, robotic automation, but other kinds, and we've seen how it works and how it 
doesn't work in different contexts. Um, and we also know, you know, that it's not just about whether they're robots or not, but actually how we treat workers and how they're, you know, positioned in relation to the robots. Do people actually lose their job when something is automated or, you know, do they get retrained and allowed to um, actually control the robots or how do you how do you reframe the job when this kind of thing comes in? Um, so I think one of the things we can think about in terms of broader effects of robots is like what has happened with prior technologies and what can we learn from that? It's you know it's not that we don't know anything about how to, how these kinds of technologies may impact society so that you know we can't really start to answer those questions without necessarily you know designing the robots and putting them in there. So I think we can reflect a little bit on, on history and the now as we design these things for the future. Leslie Samanzu asks, I see Beam listed on this slide. Is it being mm -hmm. used to help disabled adults to virtually go out places such as museums, family trips, elsewhere, et cetera? And what country is using it most currently? Um, so we used Beam's um, for a few different things, not what, um, what your um, colleague is mentioning, um, but although I could definitely imagine it used in those ways, um, we've actually used Beams to uh, connect students from, so we had a, I didn't talk about this, but we had an educational robotics project um, where we were actually designing telepresence robots with middle and high schoolers um, so they could learn something about STEM, but also the idea was to connect different schools across kind of, um, big spaces. So this was a project that was done in Alaska and in Indiana. And so we were connecting students in those different um, different areas. So one of the first times we used beams was to try to have some of that happen. Um, so it was, you know, really students kind of talking to each other and driving robots around and seeing what their different schools and environments look like. Um, I remember in our team, one of the first times we drove the robot in Alaska, it was like September or something, and we drove it outside of the building and there was snow and everybody was just, you know, flabbergasted, like, oh my, it's snow already, wow. Um, so just as a way of learning about other spaces is one way um, that we used it, but we've also used it in the intergenerational daycare, um, actually, pre-COVID because during COVID we could not go to the intergenerational daycare because of the vulnerable population there. Um, but um, yeah, we used it there to see if that was something that could be used for either visits or um, for kind of remote storytelling and, and things like that. But um, there are definitely others who study it for what you're saying, which is, you know, sometimes it could be even students going to class when they can't, you know, make it there in person um, or it could be different ways of visiting a, another place, um, like a museum or something like that, um, when you can't make it there again in person. So, um, those are definitely very viable use options for Beam. But I don't know which countries use it the most, um, although it's a U.S. company, so I would assume it's probably mo most prevalent here. But there are other types of those telepresence robots in other places, too. Um, maybe we have time. Oh, never mind. Um, well, actually, we have like one minute left, maybe. So I think we'll end it there. But thank you so much, Summer, for giving us really? such an interesting talk. We loved learning about social robots and things. I hope everyone else enjoyed it too. Yeah. My pleasure. And if anybody want, has other questions or if you want to chat, um, feel free to just email me. Um, I have a super easy to remember email, selmas at indiana.edu. Um, and I'm always happy to chat about robots and people. So just let me know.